good afternoon and welcome everybody to the Regional Housing and Growth Issues Partnership Advisory Group monthly meeting. It's March, it is April 25th at uh, 3 p.m. I'm Kiki Miller, I'm a Coeur d'Alene City Council member and we have been doing these month meetings for about 15 months now. And what we're going to do today is kind of give everyone a brief update as to the progress and what our subcommittees are up to and doing. So I wanna start out with a couple of announcements. I wanna welcome some new members. Uh, if, I, if I skipped you, we're gonna do a little housekeeping business at the end where we will be updating the flowchart that lists who all the group participants are that will be put on the website. So I'll talk about that before we leave today. And as you all recall, our meetings are always less than one hour long and we try to get through our agendas very quickly. So I appreciate everyone's support with that. A couple of things, um, welcome Maureen Dolan from the Coeur d'Alene Press and Chris Gregg from Northwest Specialty Hospital. Uh, they're new into this group. And I wanted to let you know of a couple of dates coming up for events that we will also post on the Housing and Growth Issues Partnership website that um, USDA, the Clearwater Development Council and Panhandle Area Council are doing a housing uh, forum. That's on May the 26th. There'll be more information about that on the website. And the Housing uh, Alliance, uh, Mark Tucker might have to help me out with the name on that one, is doing an event in the park on July 9th that has, uh, it's entitled in How to Remain Housed. So those are two that will have a lot more focus. We'll be keeping you updated on those housing events. Um, wanted to let you know also that uh, there's some new, um, I'll get to that one later on. So let me go ahead and go into uh, telling you about our campaign. As most of you, many of you may have already seen, myself, uh, Maggie Lyons and Ginny Gilliam have been uh, on about a two month tour of the county. And what we have done, um, I've done over 20 presentations now and I know that uh, Maggie and Ginny have done a few uh, other separate ones, so that number could be higher. But we've been in front of every city council, every planning and zoning organization, our regional chambers of, cost, uh, host, chambers of commerce, our hospitals, schools, um, anyone who's affected by the housing group, as well as a number of large industries. And so we have had um, a great deal of um, feedback, some great questions uh, from our developers and building community uh, and, and many others on rolling out where we're at, what some of the goals are and how people can get involved. So we're gonna continue that through the month of May with some more uh, presentations. If your group wants us to come and um, do that presentation, get you up to speed on where we're at, just give let me know, uh, the Housing Growth Issues Partnership website has a email address that comes directly to me. And Hillary, just uh, another housekeeping note, I'm not reading the chat boxes, so if Sean's helping with that, and if anyone um, needs to, to understand how to use the chat box, um, we're gonna be doing a question and answer at the end of this meeting if anybody has anything they wanted to share. So I understand Corey wasn't able to join us today to give us a brief update on the Idaho Workforce Housing Fund and how that role it is going, but Jack has maybe going to step in and do that for us. That would be great. Yeah, thanks, Kiki. Yeah, Corey's off today, but uh, as far as the uh, workforce housing, uh, we're in the process of uh, finishing up the uh, what we call the allocation plan, which is kind of the policy and procedures of how we will allocate <coughs> the $50 million in workforce housing uh, throughout the state of Idaho. Um, just a, re a reminder that it's 80% uh, is for urban and 20% is for rural. Um, and we're hoping to have this allocation plan uh, completed. That's probably 95% there right today. Uh, we're gonna be meeting, Corey and I are gonna be meeting with our uh, executive director and president uh, tomorrow. Uh, to get his comments, and then we could finalize it up. We'll then send it out to the developed community, um, of course, this group, uh, so they can, you can all read it and 
provide uh, comments. We'll, we'll probably have a 30 day comment period so that we can get any feedback or any uh, proposed changes. And then, um, and then we'll um, launch it. And, and uh, on August 5th, uh, we will uh, have an application period for the multifamily projects. So, uh, you know, the apartment complexes, uh, and hope, we're hoping to have this, these funds ready for those application periods too, because we will, we will allocate these funds on a competitive basis throughout the state. So that's kind of where we're at today. Happy to answer your question. Great, we will, um, we will take some questions. If anybody has anything specific on that one, um, uh, Ed? Um, yeah, hi. Uh, you mentioned on a competitive basis, uh, what are the criteria elements excuse me, that you're gonna be looking at as far as the competitive part of it? So we're gonna have basically seven regions throughout the state. So each region will have a percentage of that 40 million. Uh, it will, that won't use up the full 40 million, but then we'll have what we call a, um, kind of, we'll, we'll set aside for each region and then we'll have a plot at, at the end. So that like if, if one region, let's say Coeur d'Alene has two applications, one that gets the most points, um, you know, would win the region, but it's not necessarily that second one that comes in in the second place wouldn't be out. They would just go into uh, another set aside that would be for the whole state. And in, in this, we have it all broken out for points for each um, area. And um, I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar with our uh, tax credit rounds, but the, the application process would be very similar. Uh, to, to that. So we're, we're, like I said, we're in the process of setting up all the points for the various items that you'd get points for it in the process. Okay, thank you. Great. Thanks, Jack. We really appreciate that. It's um, new and sometimes complicated information. So it's great to be able to get this whole group up to speed. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing up, Taryn, if you could give uh, the entire group just a brief uh, update on some of the new things on the website. And also, I want to mention that there is a flow chart Taryn's going to show you, and you're going to see that coming out in an email to all of the advisory group partners. We want to make sure we have the right people named and that the right people are getting the links. I've, I read into on our, our road tr uh, trip here that we've been out um, talking with the group. I've run into a number of people who had said they wanted to be included, but we had wrong information or wrong participants. So we really wanna get the right pe people from every organization to get the link to these meetings. Taryn, can you give us just a couple minutes? Absolutely, I am going to go ahead and screen share. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, all right. So I'm going to give you guys a look at the website so that I can uh, talk a little bit and make sure everyone knows where the weekly update is. We have been updating the website on a weekly basis. So if you're looking for a summary of our working group and advisory meetings, this is where you will find it. Um, uh, the website traffic I wanted to mention has increased quite a bit. And I think that's probably due to the roadshow that's been going on. Uh, we've had 3,409 site visitors, which is an increase of uh, 1,720 over the last 30 days. Uh, we're also seeing some increase in social media traffic. So that's encouraging. Uh, the flow chart, I'll now show you the flow chart Kiki was referring to. This is a look at the flow chart, which we need to update, but it's going to show all of the volunteer subcommittees and their members, the working group, advisory group, and then those of us who are doing community outreach here. Um, and the last thing I have to show you today is the home shared Kootenai County logo that we've come up with. And I've already begun construction on that website, so. Great, thanks, Taryn. And uh, you all probably have heard a little bit about home share, but Candy Johnson is going to give us an update on that subcommittee report. Just wanted to keep all our graphics in that one screen and we'll keep moving forward on that. So next up on our agenda is David Callahan from Kootenai County who will be able to give us an update of, on what's happened with open space. Good afternoon, everyone. My core committee continues to meet on a bi-weekly, sometimes weekly basis. 
And I'm pleased to say that the Inland Northwest Land Conservancy is considering serving as our 501c3 pass-through for any fundraising that we do. I should know within the week if their board's agreeable. And we also have met with some prominent members of our community who have agreed to assist us with open space and with fundraising. So that's it for the moment. Well, that's a lot, thank you. As some of you remember about uh, a year ago, a uh, very hot topic was preservation of open space and this group um, polled their members and got their responses back. And that was the number one thing we took a hard look at. And that uh, result of that is David and his team are moving forward with those marching orders and, and getting some, some work done. So thank you, I appreciate that a lot. And, uh, and just on time as though he had ESP is Jeff Voller is connecting from the school district. And I know that there's been some activity going on, but Jeff, can you share with us what the number two goal was behind open space a year and a half ago was uh, how do we support our schools? And if Jeff, you got a minute, anything new that you can share? As soon as you unmute yourself, we'll be great. Jeff, it looks like you're unmuted, but we couldn't hear you. Can you hear us okay? He just chatted and said that he's having audio problems. Oh, okay. Said he would type an update. Okay, well, how about uh, we'll share that. I do know that we, um, Jeff has made a connection with a newcomer to our area who had some experience in another town with a great uh, model between, um, some funding partners and some land trust people and a way to house their teachers. So I'm not sure where that's at. If we don't uh, get any audio, what we'll know is that Jeff will be working with us at the working group level, give us a report on that and we'll share that back out to you next month. So Jeff, thanks for being here. Sorry about that audio, but I think that's a brief. If there was anything else, you can um, shoot that to me and we'll be sure and put it on the agenda for next time. Okay, uh, then next up, there's been a lot going on in out of the out of the road show, but um, the land acquisitions. Maggie Lyons, with who is the director of Panhandle Affordable Housing Alliance, has uh, a PowerPoint to share with us and kind of giving us a good overview of what the new role and important role that Panhandle Affordable Housing Alliance can play in uh, managing some housing uh, strategic plans here. Maggie, are you ready? I am, thanks Kiki. Let me share my screen. Hi everyone. Um, Kiki asked uh, for an overview of Panhandle Affordable Housing Alliance's role um, for all of you to understand how it's evolving. So. Um, this is where we are and just a kind of a brief overview of the work that PAHA is doing in cooperation, obviously, with the Regional Housing and Growth Issues Partnership. Um, we, um, PAHA is, uh, you know, the reorganized North Idaho Housing Coalition, and um, it really has, I think, two primary buckets now of attention for housing. Um, it's going to be still continuing in the rental world, and this will be predominantly federal subsidized housing for extremely low or very low income individuals, but also home ownership. And that was also, that was a goal of the, of the coalition for years and years and years. So it's partnerships with developers um, and landowners to really focus on local worker housing. Let me minimize this. We're real focused now on what we're calling home ownership for underserved households in Kootenai County. 
uh, the lines, you guys have heard me speak about this before, but the lines are quite blurred between our very low income and our workers here in Kootenai County. And while wages in Kootenai County are quite good, they're clearly not able to, to, to keep pace with the inflationary costs of housing, um, food, as well as gas, everything else that's in there. So we're really focusing on, on people earning $40,000 to $90,000 a year. And honestly, I mean, $30 an hour in our community is a good wage. So the key factors really are, are going to be land and, and how we organize the land to be able to bring down the cost of our worker housing. Land ownership really falls into these four buckets, you know, employers own land, developers own land, there are private landowners, and then of course our cities and municipalities also own some land. Density, these are just broad terms that seem to speak to people. I'm not talking about any one jurisdiction's type of zoning. I'm just talking about examples, cluster housing, duplexes and triplexes, smaller homes, condos, single family. We're not talking large uh, apartment complexes at all, but we're talking neighborhoods. Neighborhoods that have um, focused housing for our workers along with um, market houses. We're talking really trying to get homes in the range of 200,000 to about 350, $375,000 sale price. Affordability and access are really the, the, the two key ingredients, and we're looking probably 80% to the private market to drive it, and then the role that the private public market has in this as well. I think the predominant um, affordability issue for our extremely, for, for what I'll, I'll call our 60%, our, our 40% um, AMIers, people making $20 to $30 an hour, probably the only way to really get the home price down to that lower tiered level is going to be through a community land trust where there is no cost of land. The community land trust, Paha actually bought land for a project that we're launching in, in July at cost. And then that landowner took a tax deduction for the difference between market and cost. And so that is an attractive um, option for some landowners, but I think, um, to reach the 200 to $250,000, $275,000 priced home, we're going to have to have no land cost whatsoever. So community land trust is what we're focusing on there. Here, the land is actually leased to the homeowners. We've, we're working with an attorney who specializes in land use um, in Idaho. Um, we're working on a number of deed restrictions. One of the primary concerns we've heard out of our jurisdictions and really people who live here is the concern that workers are displaced by out-of-towners. You've heard Kiki talk a lot about this. So really there is a lot of flexibility through these landowner restrictions to ensure access and affordability really by the people that we're targeting to put into our worker housing. There's quite a bit of flexibility as I mentioned. And of course, um, one, of the, one of the things that cannot be done is the discrimination against protected classes. But under Idaho law, as long as that doesn't happen, there's quite a bit of flexibility. So right now I'm working with the attorney to come up with a range of um, deed restrictions that meet the concerns um, and legitimately preserve uh, access to the housing that we're hopeful can be built in these price ranges for our local workers. Here are just a couple of, of examples. Um, maximum income limits and assets uh, can be set by the private landowner and also by, so the land trust can do all this too. It's actually um, in the land lease itself is where the covenants are put, um, but private developments that are private land can also do these land uh, restrictions. We can designate occupation, we can designate residency requirements. We can designate that it must be a primary residence so that rentals aren't um, a, a result of, of this housing. We can also, even a private landowner can, can limit the resale price. One of the things that's really brilliant about the land trust model is it is one way to ensure affordability in perpetuity. Typically leases are about 99 years the appreciation level is capped, usually tied to some inflationary index. And so while the homeowner can build some wealth, they do not 
enjoy the upside of a wild market ride. Typically for private landowners, um, they the deed restrictions on, on items like this will range anywhere between five to 15 years for a sunset period. They're really controlled through HOAs predominantly. So anyway, we, we're pretty excited. We're talking to some developers who are very interested in this. Um, and um, our goal is to, to find some public monies with, with a development um, in terms of trying to find funding, one-time funding for some land acquisition to put into a community land trust. So I don't know if there are any questions or Kiki, if you'd like me to cover anything else. Nope, I think that that's great. I think that, that it, it's a new and somewhat complicated issue. So we'll probably be talking about it again and again as progress is made. And as um, we appreciate PAHA and everything that you're doing and spending uh, in order to get those facts vetted and share with us. So that's, that's great work. Um, I think that once we're down the road, we'll schedule another presentation and have Maggie do that update and share some potential real life projects. And, let's hope, huh? and then, and let's hope that that happens. Yeah, let's hope. And I will, I will mention uh, this because we're on that subject and I don't wanna run out of time at the very end, but we've been discussing under the developer, developer and builder outreach that Maggie is moving forward with uh, the developers council through the North Idaho Building Contractors Association, where she will be getting those people that are potential landowners and home builders to start the education process of what she had just shown with us and how community land trusts work and how it can work from, for them in the private sector, moving forward ideas to help our local worker housing shortage. So that is going to be happening, I believe within this month. So there will be more coming out as some uh, de details are known about that. And so we really appreciate any of the NIBCA people who are attending and uh, all of the effort that they are giving to understand and try to be proactive in helping make some win-wins out there for everyone. So thank you, Maggie. Um, next up on the list is Carrie, and I understand Carrie's gone on birthday month. That resident-owned communities project is where we're turning, uh, we have an organization that Carrie is working with. What I understand to be the progress to date is they are have identified a couple dozen mobile home park owners and are reaching out specifically to sit down with them. Uh, Victoria uh, Bruno from resident-owned communities is is, I'm not sure if I had her last name, it's Oban, uh, um, O'Bannon, sorry about that, um, is reaching out to those uh, mobile home park owners individually to let them know there's an opportunity when they are ready to sell to help uh, transfer the title and the, the property and the control of where those mobile home owners are into the tenants uh, realm. So we'll get you more information when Carrie is back. The next one up is uh, brand new. You've probably seen a lot of buzz on HomeShare Kootenai County. And Candy Johnson is gonna give us an update as to where we are with that. And you already saw the new logo. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Candy. Okay, so I don't have to screen share the logo, but uh, this is the update <laughs> from HomeShare Kootenai County. Um, first of all, um, we were initially thinking about running under uh, the Elder Help 501c3 nonprofit heading. However, their board did meet and they felt it was best not to go under that and that we would go forward to establish our own. So we're gonna be working on that direction to set up a separate 501c3 for Home Share Kootenai County. And then also we do have a, a 10,000 donation in the wings as soon as we can get these uh, entity set up uh, for things so that we have that bank account in place to put it. And we've been working on developing our budget for the operations and marketing and some outlines of what those roles would look like and, and developing that. And I did want to mention um, the, uh, just to stress the, uh, what the potential home providers and home seekers would look like. The potential home providers would look like empty nesters with separate teen spaces who aren't used to a quiet house, snowbirds who need a house sitter they know and that would know their home, senior couples who enjoy company at any age, elderly who would welcome some extra help and security of a housemate, a single person who could use a few extra dollars, 
a traveling worker or a retiree who would like someone there at the home when they're away, or recently divorced or widowed who are in transition. Those people who might be seeking the home could be hospitality workers who move seasonally, empty nesters who want to downsize and eliminate home maintenance responsibilities, teachers who need nine months out of the year housing, traveling nurses who may rotate to other towns, college students who need housing during school sessions, or maybe young adults saving for a future home purchase. So when we think about this, it's not just a program for the elderly, but it is for a, a lot of ages. And so we, we expand our um, vision for that and uh, we move forward with regular meetings. Great. Thanks, Candy. You've been just great in organizing and we're excited about that program. And, and we know that uh, elder help support has been just tremendous, but it does kind of lean it towards a, a program that narrows the scope of what the, the National Home Share Resource Organization tells us is that we need to keep that scope broad for both home providers and for home seekers. And uh, we know that this isn't going to solve all the housing crisis, but it can certainly open some inventory that already exists and maybe uh, relieve a little pressure for some of those local workers who are really feeling the pinch about right now. Um, Next up is Marie Nail, and this is a new subcommittee. This is a project committee, actually, and Marie had to be away today, so she emailed me some information. Marie is representing Coeur d'Alene 2030, and what they are doing based on some input from other nonprofits who uh, had said that they wanted a better picture of what was happening in the rental market. And we had a fabulous job done with the affordability and availability study that the university of Idaho did, and I'm sure you've all read that more than once by now, but um, it didn't delve real deeply into the rental market because that's just a real moving target, and to do uh, the professional and, um, you know, standardized study that they did, it wasn't something that they were going to be able to execute. This is also not um, a, a study done by University of Idaho. What CDA 2030 doing is kind of a thumbnail sketch, a point in time, if you will, of this is what the rental market capacity may look like, and this is generally what the rental need is looking like. So that group is going to be serving property management companies, um, pending projects, oh, and pending projects by surveying cities and developers as well as they are doing a large survey that will be sent out to employers and large organizations who have a typical rental base that they can do a short survey on and they will get that information back and distributed to us by June 1. A small working group is getting together next Tuesday for the strategy of the survey rollout and they'll be ready to do a report at the working group meeting after that. So that will help some um, with another uh, snapshot of what's happening in the rental arena. So next up is another new group. And I think I saw Lindsay Allen jump in here. And I have to tell you, I did a presentation to the Coeur d'Alene Association of Realtors. And they're a very engaged, active, and um, interested group in, in looking at getting involved in the Housing and Growth Issues Partnership. So Lindsay, if you just have a, a moment to give us a brief update about what your uh, task force is up to. Hi, um, so we put out to our board and I think uh, maybe our community outreach committee um, and any other agents who are kind of passionate about this to start a task force to help um, support uh, regional housing and growth issues partnerships. So at the moment, we're kind of gathering some people um, and we'll do a formal meeting. It's very kind of very early in its inception, but I know that the agents, there's many of us who are, um, who find this to be an important, uh, an important aspect of our future in this community. So we wanna do what we can at the association to support that, you know, whether it be, you know, finding property owners or working with developers or fundraising or creating awareness in our community. Um, we're here to help support this group in any way that we can. Great. 
we're adding you as a regular subcommittee at the work group. And so we'll look forward to more reports on some of the projects as you get those nailed down. So appreciate it. And Lindsay, thank you. Um, Lindsay, are you the current uh, chair of the Coeur d'Alene Association Real Board of Realtors? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's exciting to have such a huge group. I think that's a thousand members strong or something like that. And that's at 2000, sorry, um, wait, that's a surprise. But anyway, that's a, that's a fabulous group to, to um, put some energy behind this. And, and we really appreciate that. I'm gonna Absolutely. jump right, I'm gonna, thank you. I'm gonna jump right into uh, uh, one of the things that we have been talking about in all of our conversations is you know, money makes everything easier. And so we, um, we know that we have some options here. Uh, one of the fundraising things the Association of Realtors has been, had just mentioned, there's other revenue streams that we have uh, places that we can house that funding for potential work through the Community Land Trust with what PAHA is doing. And uh, the Idaho Housing Partnership Foundation is an organization that we've mentioned before, but I wanted to keep it top of mind that we have some people that I've gotten together in a kind of a think tank on how we can create uh, regional revenue streams into that organization that can be utilized to execute some of the goals that PAHA has and some of the projects that we're talking about. So as those, um, as those actually come to fruition and are ironed out, we'll be sending in a document to update everyone out probably by email. So I wanted to mention that to you. So moving on, um, as I talked earlier, there's connections um, on the developer outreach side, but we have a lot of other potential with new subcommittees that are coming together. So our next work group is gonna have a very uh, a strong working agenda on how we're gonna start to make some of these connections and actually move some of the projects forward. I do have a couple people. Um, I wanted to tell you that uh, Donna Brundage uh, chatted and and let me know that it's the behavioral health and um uh, region one behavioral health and saint vincent de paul who are putting on the july 9th event and you can contact donna at saint vincent de paul if you want more information on that or to get involved in that one so i'm moving quickly to the end of the agenda today but i wanted to open this up to questions from anyone in the advisory group and let you know that our next work group uh, meeting is going to be focused on connecting these subcommittees as well as a lot of feedback that we got on this uh, campaign that we've been doing presentations. So we're gonna be answering a lot of questions during the next work group and that will come back to the advisory group um, along with another poll next month. So if I have any questions, any of the panelists or any of the subcommittee people will be happy to answer that. And I, um, I do want, wanted to also let you know, if you will please, we do need volunteers to start getting involved. I just had someone ask in the chat box if they could volunteer and we will follow up with you, absolutely. We've got some new areas uh, with Home Share and some of the others. But if you can share out to the rest of your organizations, if they'd like to volunteer, please just go to the website. There's a contact page information there and that comes directly in. We're taking information for uh, home share on that website as well as any volunteers within the Regional Housing and Growth Issues Partnership too. I don't see any questions and answers in the chat box. Okay, there was one in the Q&A and there was some in the chat box from James McDay. And James, I think you're still on, but I was trying to respond to you and it said you're not. So anyway, um, I. Was, he had some questions about the resident owned communities program and I know you gave an update today so I was trying to get more clarification from him on his question specifically so James if you're on can you please chat okay you are here can you please chat um, what specifically your questions were and if we can help clarify that a little bit more today or if we need to get back to you on that. Well, James, maybe you can just shoot an email and we'll get that we'll get back to you on that one. I'm not seeing any question there. Uh, 
Are we saying he's here? He's muted. Um, we could try to do the audio to allow him to talk if you want to do that rather than the chat. Uh, that's going to be up to you. Oh, he just wants to follow up on um, Carrie Thorson's project. So yeah, we don't have more James information than that, other than Victoria and Carrie are compiling a list of who those home mobile home owners are. Many of them obviously aren't, you know, at the site. And so what they're trying to do is do one on one contact to those mobile home just so that they have the information on when it comes time to sell that there's another way that they can, they can move that property. Maybe just add one thing to that process that maybe hasn't been said out loud yet. And, and maybe Lindsay Allen can kind of confirm this. A lot of those properties are actually valued at the cash flow that the rental and stream from all of the different places brings in. So that option for the owners to sell to the, you know, the occupants actually is very attractive because they're already kind of paying what the property is going to be valued at in the you know, real estate world as far as those properties are concerned. So it's really more about getting the owners to start talking about it, which if I understand correctly, that's the step that it's really at. It's more about putting it in their heads for when they decide they want to you know, change ownership. That's, that's exactly right. It's an education process. And I think um, we, we had a mobile home owner who just didn't, wasn't aware that there was something like that out there. And that's, that's what, um, that's what we want to do is make sure we've got that in front of them and that we all keep that um, information available and, and support those kinds of decisions when they want to make them. Okay, so I am um, looking at uh, grants on my horizon here for some of the projects. So I know that there's a lot of people who have said, why don't you get a grant for this or get a grant for that? Any of you have ideas on um, where we should seek grants and which one of our subcommittees could use that funding and what for? Um, I'm, I'm always, um, I'm all ears on uh, what new creative funding sources we can. So uh, grants is gonna come up in workshop this next time, as well as other feedback. If any, if no one else has a question, I will be happy to let you all out early. And um, Candy, I know I need to follow up with you on a couple of things, so I'll give you a call later. And uh, if there's anything else anyone needs, um, Steve Adams from City of Rathdrums, good to see you in here. And Zach, good to see you from Hayden. Um, appreciate everybody's technical um, difficulty um, overcoming ability. We've kind of gotten used to this Zoom business, but still get a little bit snafued here and there. So that's all we'll have for today. I will be giving you um, a reminder to look at the update on the website because we're putting that button out there so that you can be fully informed of where we're at. And I will see you all next month. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day.